This is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on him is not condemned, but he who believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. For by grace we have been saved through faith, and that not of ourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we get started, let's go to the Lord and ask his guidance on our study this morning. Father, we're thankful that as we come together this morning that we have your word to go to, that we do not base our beliefs on personal opinions or personal inclinations. We do not base our opinions on simply the uh, thought-out ideas or philosophies of one group or another, but that we have a written authoritative revelation that comes from outside the created order that is revealed by you through human beings, but in such a way that you controlled, protected the outcome so that that which was written down, that which was preserved through the ages is preserved for us without error. That we may know your truth and that we may know that there is absolute truth that exists outside of and beyond human experience that is not an opinion, but is a clear statement of eternal fact, eternal truth. Father, as we come face to face with your word today, as it exposes in us who we are, reveals uh, the flaws and failures of our own uh, sin nature, our own uh, humanity, we pray that we might uh, recognize the problem as well as the solution that ultimately it is uh, we have to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone for our salvation. But then as new creatures in Christ, it is incumbent upon us to grow, to mature, to make your word a very much part of our thinking and our life. And Father, so today we pray that you would uh, challenge us from your word and that we might be responsive to it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. As we look at our study in Colossians, one of the things that I have focused on in the last few weeks is the key verbs that are used in this whole section, back, starting back in Colossians uh, 2.11 and moving through the last part of the second chapter and into the third chapter, related to two ideas. One was the command to recognize that we have already done, commands related rather to things that we have already done, that have already taken place. And this relates to two basic commands. One is that we have already put to death the old man, that is everything that we were before we were saved. And we are have already put off or taken off or removed that uh, old person, the trappings, everything related to that old identity, and that that has been replaced by a new identity. And so there is there are passages here which talk about what has taken place already, what has been accomplished already, because we have uh, died with Christ, uh, chapter 2, verse 20, and we have been raised with Christ, chapter 3, verse 1. And we have, because we have died with Christ, we are expected to now put to death the members of our uh, body, which are basically tools for expressing our sin nature. The meaning there, as I pointed out the last few weeks, is ultimately we're to uh, put to death the deeds of the sin nature. We are, this is no longer to characterize our life. And that is parallel to the imagery that we find in, 
that we are to, because we have already put off or taken off like a, like a garment, taken off the old man, we are to uh, put on the new man. This is uh, chapter 2, uh, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 9, where we're told, do not lie to one another since you have put off or are removed like a garment, the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man. That's talking about something that happened at the time that we're saved. There is this, this identity change that takes place at that instant of faith alone in Christ alone. Uh, Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.17, that we are new creatures in Christ. Therefore, all things are new, old things have passed away. There's a we're a totally new person. Now, some of you are like me, and you <clears throat> trusted in the Lord when you were a child. So the idea of all things being new is maybe a little difficult to grasp because it's difficult to really remember that you were just such a rotten, nasty little sinner when you were three or four or five years old, and so you don't remember that that period prior to that. But others of you. Uh, did not understand the gospel and were not saved, did not trust in Christ until sometime later in life. And the reality of that change is is more of a reality to you. In fact, there are some that may have pretty significant uh, uh, testimonies of their transition from being an unbeliever to being a believer because of the realization of what uh, happened at the cross and the fact that Jesus Christ freely, graciously, completely, fully, paid the penalty for our sins, and by simply trusting in him, you had a new life in Christ. But that new life, that new identity, as I've gone through in the past few weeks, carries with it new new priorities. It carries with it new characteristics. It carries with it uh, basically a new dress code. We become a new person, and that new person is going to dress differently. There's a new dress code. Unfortunately, too many Christians are spiritually AWOL. AWOL is defined in the military as being in the right place at the right time in the right uniform. A lot of Christians may be in the right place at the right time, but they're out of uniform. They've got the wrong clothing on to use the metaphor, the analogy that Paul uses in this chapter. They haven't put on the clothes that are to be characteristic of the new man. And using another metaphor common to Paul, they are are children of light, but they are not walking like children of light. They are walking like they're still in darkness. They're still uh, members of the world system rather than thinking as and acting and living as a believer. So when we get start getting into this section now of Colossians 3, Paul draws a conclusion that's indicated by that first word in verse 12. Uh, <clears throat> Therefore, he says, he's going to draw a conclusion. Now this begins a impressively significant section of Scripture. It will take us some time because... What Paul does is he hits just in in, in bullets you know, key principles for how we're to live and how we're to think. But if you read it just as a grocery list, as and it's a short grocery list, it's easy to think that that all this is is just a list of of, of moral precepts. And one of the most difficult things, I think, for Christians to grasp and understand and for theologians to grasp and understand is Christianity is not, a, not simply a moral or ethical system. It includes that, but unbelievers can be moral. A lot of very religious people who have no understanding that, Christ, that they're sinners or that Christ paid the penalty for their sins are, are very moral people. And they're, they're trying to work their way to heaven. They think that by being moral, by being good, by being involved in church or religious organizations, that they can impress God, and they are very intent upon that. And so there are some unbelievers that are extremely moral, but it doesn't get them anywhere. 
morality isn't the same thing as spirituality because as the Bible defines spirituality, spirituality is a, has to do with a person's relationship with God, that, that uh, uni- unity we have with, with God. Spirituality is not a matter of, of feeling. It's not a matter of uh, having a sense of, of somehow uh, uh, being tranquil or at peace with the world or some other emotion. Spirituality is one of the greatly abused words of our culture. All kinds of people are involved in spirituality, and it's almost been redefined culturally which for you who understand biblical terminology means in a worldly sense, it's defined culturally as as basically being self-actualized to borrow from Maslow's uh, psychological terminology. In other words, it's being all that you can be, to use the army slogan. It is nothing more than than the maximization of your uh, self-absorption. It's being what you think you ought to be and being so focused on you that you're doing well. And since you have this sense of well-being, you've become very spiritual. And that can be expressed in a lot of different ways. But the Bible never deals with these issues on the basis of these subjective ideas of how we feel, our emotional stability, or things of that nature. It always grounds things on some external objective reality. And if you were in Bible class or listened to the class the other night in, on Thursday night, when we were studying in Romans, <clears throat> one of the points that I brought out as we were studying on reconciliation is that in God's relationship to man, he begins with a covenant. He begins with a contract, a, a legal codification, a legal outline of what God expects man to be, what the, what the issues are. And this is established through the language of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. God created man in his image and likeness. He was given authority to rule as God's representative over the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, um, the fish of the sea, and that he was to guard and take care of this, this environment, the garden that he was placed in. There was only one caveat, and that was the prohibition that he was not to eat from the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. And if he did, there would be devastating, serious consequences. He would die. I'm, I'm wondering, I suspect that God did. The text doesn't tell us that in, during the time that the Lord uh, spent uh, on a daily basis communicating, walking, teaching, Adam and Eve, that the Lord probably had to communicate to them what death was. I assume that was somewhat of a difficult concept for someone in perfect environment who had never experienced pain, suffering, loss, death of any kind to grasp the full ramifications of what death meant in terms not only of of separation, but also in terms of what it would mean in all of its different manifestations, bringing uh, suffering and and death, physical death, uh, and many other things into uh, human experience, but that that those the, that structure that's given there in Genesis chapters one and two defines the relationship of God with man, and it's based on based on covenant. It's based on law, and that that provides. The, the, the boundaries for the, the health of that relationship with God. Then I went on to apply that to, to marriage, that we come at this thing, the world has so perverted marriage, we, we, first of all, we don't understand love anymore. Uh, that's not just a problem of modern culture, that's a historic problem. Thinking of love as an emotion, if you look it up in the dictionary, almost any dictionary, it starts with defining love as an emotion. And we really have a problem with, with love if it is an emotion as a, as a, as a Christian, because there are all of these commands in the Bible to love God and to love others. And if it's an emotion, how can you command an emotion? Uh, every now and then, uh, I'm, when I've gotten in a conversation with some people, it's, it's, it's kind of funny today. It's sad because it just shows the, 
sort of the lack of training or education that a lot of people have today, but their lack of understanding. I, I've had conversations where I've made that statement. Say, well, you can't command an emotion. They go, why not? People don't understand that. I mean, that's just fundamental. In fact, in, as as far back as the early uh, early period of this uh, this age, not long after the destruction of the temple in uh, in in Jerusalem. And as the early rabbis were reformatting uh, what became known as rabbinic Judaism, this was this became a major issue in their thinking as they were faced with commands from Deuteronomy that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And they said, well, uh, some of the rabbis said, well, how can you command an emotion? See, even as far back as the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century, probably further back into into the ancient world, you have people who assumed that love was an emotion. And so in, in rabbinical thought, they, they got really sidetracked through most of the Middle Ages and later, and they would redefine, this is typical of rabbinic Judaism, to the Mishnah would sort of reinterpret the Torah, the Old Testament, and then the Gemara, which is the commentary on the Mishnah, would reinterpret the Mishnah, and that is how the Talmud came into existence, which is the foundation for modern Orthodox Judaism. And it wasn't until almost into the modern era when there were some within the Jewish uh, rabbinical tradition who began to say, well, if God commands it, that must mean we ought to be able to do it. So maybe it's not so much of an emotion af- after all. And then within a minority of this stream of individuals uh, in, in Hebrew studies, a realization that the word love is always couched within this kind of covenant framework. Isn't that interesting that love, in, if you go back and you read through Deuteronomy, what does Deuteronomy mean? It means a second law. It's not really a second law, uh, but it is, a, it is Moses' divinely inspired commentary of the original Mosaic covenant given at Mount Sinai. And so it is a covenantal document. It, it's, a, it's a contract. It's a restatement of the original contract. And a contract is a legal document, and yet all through this legal document of Deuteronomy, you have this emphasis on love, love, love. So that immediately takes love out of the realm of emotion. Love isn't about how we feel about somebody. Love isn't about how they make us feel. Love has something to do with a transcendental uh, reality that is grounded in something that is unshakable, uh, in absolutes. And once you get a culture that it rejects absolutes, then, of course, the whole idea of love is going to be one of your first uh, casualties, because if you no longer have an eternal absolute upon which you can ground anything to have stability, then love has no stability, and it, it, it's taken out of the transcendental realm and put totally within the realm of creation, which is a realm of flux and change. And the consequences of that are, are, are inevitable in terms of the destruction of, of human relationships, specifically marriage and family, which is something we've seen over the last hundred, hundred years or so. Now, I, there's a reason I've gone off to sidetrack a little bit to talk about love, because as you look at this section that uh, I'm addressing this morning, in Colossians 3, 12 to 14, we're moving to the end game of a discussion about and a reference to love. It starts <clears throat> with Paul's command, Therefore is the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Now, this is a fascinating section of verses. Uh, 
And it's the kind of thing that always, I start getting into this, I think, well, this looks pretty simple. It's just a kind of a grocery list of virtues there in verse 12. We've covered some of these before. And then <clears throat> you have a reference to forgiveness and grace in chapters, I mean, in verse 13. And then this leads to, to love. But, but the more I, I started digging beneath the surface here, there's some interesting things here, some of which is sort of clouded or are uh, uh, <clears throat> clouded over by, by the English translation. So I want to, first thing, is just kind of a little fly over here and look at the key, key phrases. We have the, that this is a conclusion, we're to put on. That's our main verb. Now, I know some people hate it when I get off into grammar, but grammar is the hidden structure of whatever it is that we're reading. And sometimes if we don't understand that 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 skeletal structure of what it is that we're reading, especially when it's a, a a long section or complicated section, then we can sort of miss out on what's there. And even if we have a general sense of what's there, when you take the time to to focus on it a little bit, it it brings some things out that that we might not have noticed right away. This command is to put on something, and we've looked at this some in the past. Uh, and it is to put on something, and then we're given this list of uh, five character qualities, five virtues, tender mercies or compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. Now, if you have been hanging with me through our study, you note that back in uh, Colossians 2.5, where there was a command to put to death, just the opposite, to remove something, to put to death your members which are on the earth, and then there's a list of five. Uh, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil, desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Notice those are all sort of oriented towards overt sins or the overt expression of a mental attitude sin of, of sexual lust, as I pointed out, that they all seem to have this orientation towards uh, uh, some sort of sexual lust, even though they may be expressed in some other areas of life as well. So that was po- probably a problem in the Colossian community and the licentiousness. And then there's another list in verse 8, but now you yourselves are to put off, and that's the opposite word from the word we have here in 3.12. 3.12 is to put on. The word put off is to remove a garment. We are to put off all of these things, uh, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, abusive language, out of your mouth. Again, a list of five things. Um, before I started having computer problems, my goal was to create a chart with a comparison contrast to the five things we're to remove and the five things we're to put on. Um, due to glitches with the computer, I didn't get that chart made, but that's something you could easily do at home to show that contrast. There are certain things that in part of our new identity are not part of the dress code. We don't dress like that anymore. And then the, in contrast, we are to dress a certain way. Now, the whole idea of dress code started getting a lot of bad publicity back in the 60s with the self-absorbed, narcissistic uh, baby boom generation. And I remember in uh, I was in high school, I'm dating myself at this point, uh, I was in high school, my, junior, my senior year was when the dress code shifted. There was a lot of things that happened as a result of that. Or it, it, I don't want to create the idea that it's, it was so simplistic that you change the dress code and all these other things happened. I think they were all basically manifestations of other things that shifted. So there was sort of an attendant uh, circumstance idea that that dress code was part of the result of something greater, but it also tended to be part of a movement away from certain uh, historical absolutes that gave a certain stability to to uh, culture and in school to student culture. I remember when I was in when I was in high school, I was uh, one of the band boys. I was in the band and um, marching band, and we would have band parties every uh, time there was after a football game, and some parent would open up their house, and we would have a party over there. And there was never any drinking or drugs or, or anything like that, and it wasn't just that I was naive. I mean, I heard this from an individual I had a conversation with about three years later, uh, this young lady who was a sophomore when I was a senior and was dating a friend of mine, 
then when I went to went, went to college, and I was a junior in college, she came as a freshman, and we got to be friends. And she told me how from the year I was a senior to the year she was a senior. By the time she was a senior the, at the band parties, they were openly smoking marijuana at the parties and drinking and all this other thing. Just just in that two-year period, there was this 180-degree shift that occurred in, in student culture. And the point that I'm making here is this idea that we see here in Scripture of a dress code is part of recognizing that there is a code of conduct and a way of dressing that is typical of the world, and that when you change your, the identity of who you are and the way you think, that there is a consequent change of dress code and code of conduct that goes with being a Christian. So these are identified with these five uh, five characteristics here, and if we took the time to break them down, which I'll do eventually, uh, we have tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. At the very core, the one thing these all have in common is a foundation of not being self-absorbed. There's a, none of, you can't be self-absorbed and have any of these. These are all gracious expressions of a non-self-based mindset, non-arrogant mindset. So the command, though, is just put on. I have that underlined. So then the next action that we have is the next phrase underlined in verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. And so we ought to ask the question, well, how does bearing with one another or putting up with one another and forgiving one another relate to putting on these things? Now, it's interesting, and I'll get into the grammar of this a little bit, but, but among a, a majority of, of Greek knowledgeably, not, uh, uh, theologians or knowledgeable of the Greek commentators, they, the majority want to argue that these are also in, are basically imperatival participles. We know they're participles because of the I-N-G ending, and they should be understood to be just, the, just another part of the list. I'm going to tell you, it's not. That's not right. And I, th- I think I can argue a better case for it because too often what's happened in our study of the language, and you've heard, sometimes you might have gotten that impression listening to me, but you've heard others probably who have done this where we so particleize the words in a sentence in terms of our analysis that it's, it's important to look at the verb and to look at the noun and look at all the individual parts of speech, but those individual parts of speech are not just sitting there as isolated elements. They're part of phrases and clauses and whole elements, and so the meaning is often greater than the sum of the parts. And we can do damage to a text by saying, well, it's an imperatival verb, and so you also have an imperatival participle, so these are just additional participles. I think the participles are, are, have an imperatival sense, which they draw from the main verb, but we don't, don't divorce them from one another. And I'll show you what I mean in a minute. So we're to bear one with one another, forgive one another, and then there's a subordinate conditional clause, and if anyone has a complaint against another, even as. So the bearing with one another and forgiving one another is then qualified and explained further as even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. And then if you look at verse 14, I've got the put on in italics, and if you look at your Bible, it's in italics there also, because the verb is repeated. It is assumed to be there, but Paul, as he typically does, leaves it out because the main clause goes back to the beginning. He says, but above all things, love which is the bond of perfection. So we're to put on tender mercies, kindness, humility. That's our main verb, but it governs this last phrase as well. And so this idea of put on controls the whole idea of this section that we're to be clothed differently. And we've seen this theme developed in the previous verses. Colossians 2, 11 and 12 says that in Him, that relates to our position in Christ, uh, we were uh, spiritually, that is, spiritually circumcised by putting off the body of sin. So that's positional putting off of that uh, old man identity. Chapter 3, verse 8 expresses the experiential idea that we are to put off all these things, even though positionally it's already been removed. 
experientially, we still have the sin nature and we still sin. And in contrast to putting off certain things, we're to put on the new man. Same idea, the positional idea, same verb is used, as I pointed out the last few weeks in Colossians 3, 27 and 28, that in that action known as the baptism into Christ, we put on Christ. It's a positional thing, as we see in this diagram, that there is an identification and a unification with Jesus Christ that occurs at the instant of faith in Christ. Understanding this is just the foundation for understanding everything that Paul says from Colossians 2.11 all the way down through, through chapter 3. And if we, I keep coming back to this every week because I, I don't think that when, when most of us think about how we should live the Christian life, that the place that our thinking goes is to our identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And yet every time Paul talks about this in Romans 6, in Ephesians 4 and 5, and here, that's where he goes. So that ought to tell us something about how we ought to be thinking about these things, that this isn't just some nice doctrine, it just something isn't just something that theologians talk about, but this, for the Apostle Paul, is foundational to to our own understanding and motivation to Uh, for the Christian life. Baptism has that idea of identification, but it's more than just getting a new ID card. There is an inherent transformation that occurs in that act of baptism. It is a because baptism is not only a picture of identification, but it's identification for for a reason. And that identification is to, to positionally cleanse us and 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 show that and, and and apply that forgiveness that is now ours in Christ, so that we have positionally put off the old man and put on the new man. We've got the new ID card. We've got a new uh, new family. We have a new relationship with God. But now we have to see that in action, and that's the walk by the Spirit, which is the right side of this chart. Now, I think that's about as far as I got trying to clean things up this morning before the computer just started to fight me. So let's go back and look at, 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 at this, this particular phrase. In fact, I think I just noticed that as I went through that, that one of the charts I put on here didn't come through. So uh, maybe it's that slide. Maybe it did. Yes, it did. Okay, so I've tried to expand it a little bit in this in this breakdown or paraphrase of Colossians 3, 12 to 14. This is the thought flow, and it's simple. It's just so simple. Sometimes we can, we, we can make the simple complex because in the Word of God, there's just so many levels, so many depths of understanding. But, but once we understand the simplicity of this, then it's easy to sort of peel back the onion and get into the complexities of it. Paul says, therefore, put on, and then he lists these character qualities. Put on, and then... There are the two participles of Colossians 3, which grammatically, in, in many cases, should be understood as really a, a, an instrumental adverbial participle, which explains how the command is carried out. So you don't just separate the command, okay, here's the command that we're going to talk about putting on, and then, oh yes, we have these subsequent statements here that we have to bear with one another and we have to forgive one another as if they're three independent things. What Paul is saying isn't put on these characteristics. He's saying put them on by bearing and forgiving with one another. So it's a, it's it, the, the bearing and the forgiving tell us in a very practical way, how we put these character qualities into action. It's not just lists of these are things that should characterize your life, including bearing with one another and forgiving one another, but the bearing with one another and the forgiving with one another tells us how we clothe ourselves with these character qualities because as we looked at those qualities and talked about the fact that they're involved with tender mercies or compassion, and when we are true, compassion isn't just a, a, a feeling of care for someone or concern about their circumstances, but, but with that compassion, there's going to be the fact that we will bear 
uh, with him. This is the same word that's used over in 1 Corinthians 13 when it talks about uh, the quali- characteristic of love is to bear all things, to put up with all things. When Isn't it interesting if we... I'm, I'm going to use a political illustration here. If you like the guy who's in office, it's real easy for you to overlook some of the things he's done that maybe you didn't agree with, especially as election time comes along, things heat up and things become a little more uh, <clears throat> a little more animated. And the other guy might have done some good things, but we ignore those very easily and we just focus on the wrong things that were done. And we do that with people. People we love and we care about may have some glaring flaws, and we tend to just ignore those until all of a sudden we get mad at them, and then we remember the bad things and not the good things. And and bearing one another with one another here is that idea of we're going to put up with the other person, and we're not going to maximize their flaws and minimize their, their strengths. We understand that the person we love and care about has flaws. Maybe they're great flaws, maybe they're small flaws, but they've got flaws, but we're not going to dwell upon those and focus upon those. So that's one way we express, how do we express compassion? How do we put on compassion? By bearing with one another. Uh, Kindness. That's being kind to somebody. We're not going to put, we don't want to emphasize their bad things and when we get mad at them, bring those things up and throw them in their face. Kindness, humility, which is an expression of our uh, obedience to God. Humility and meekness are not this kind of emotional sort of uh, uh, wimpy mentality that often comes across in, in the modern usage of these terms. Moses was considered the most humble man in the Old Testament. Humility is ultimately orientation to authority. Somebody who will do what they're told to do is a humble person. They're not asserting their will over against the will of the person in authority. So someone who's humble and someone is meek is someone who is under the authority of God and isn't asserting their own agenda, but they are carrying out God's agenda. And long-suffering means is makrothemia, meaning you put up with something for a long time. So how do you do that? You do it by putting up with one another, bearing with one another, and by forgiving one another, even as Christ forgave you. And the word there for forgiveness isn't the word afiemi, which is a word that's used in, for example, 1 John 1, 9. It's the word charizomai, which means we're going to deal with the person in grace. That's that same word that was used back in our study of Colossians 2, uh, where 2, uh, 13 And 14, when it talks about uh, you being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, he, God, has made alive together with him by forgiving you, charizomai, by being gracious to you, by extending his grace to you and forgiving all trespasses, eradicating those things. So that's the idea of Christ forgiving you. And then the Greek term that is used there is the term... Uh, at the last phrase there, so also, so also you must do is interesting. It is only three words in the Greek. It's uh, uh, the first word is hutos, which is the same word that is used at the beginning of John three sixteen, where we read, "For God so loved the world." That's how it's translated in in First John one. Not, I mean, in John three sixteen, as so, uh, and same here. So you must also do. But the word has the idea in this manner, in this way. And so in John 3.16, as I've translated, God loved the world in this manner that he gave his unique son that whoever believes in him should have everlasting life. So it gives us a picture of how God loves in John 3.16. Here the picture is of forgiveness as Christ forgave each one of us in that same way, you also. That's the mandated. There's not a, the, the idea of must isn't there. That's, that's just added for clarification. That's the idea, but it's not stated. In fact, by leaving the verb out, it's much stronger. It's simply, in this manner, you too. And then we come to the the 14th verse and says, but above all these things and beyond this even, above this, 
Paul says, above this, love. No verb. But the verbs implied there, and the, the only place you get a finite verb is if you go back to the idea of put on. So Colossians 3.14 is an extension. Therefore, put on these five things. And then he talks about how you do that through forgiveness, bearing with one another forgiveness. And then he says, and beyond those five things, put on, he picks up the same idea, the main verb back from verse 12, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Now, doesn't that warm your heart? Didn't you get a lot out of it when you read the bond of perfection? What in the world does that mean? Now, I'm not sure how other translations handle that, but when you look at what the Greek says, it is, it, it, it's a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal statement. It says, put on love. And then he's going to say something about love. Uh, above this, put on love, which is... And then we're going to define love here and the role of love in all of this. It's the, and then we have a word soon, desmos, and the root word there, desmos, has to do with a, a chains or if you're in prison and you're put in bonds, that's the idea. You're being chained to something or joined to something. And, and, and then it has a prefix soon, which means with. And that is the idea of, of uh, that word is used also in medical texts to refer to ligaments. That's which joins muscles and attaches muscles to the joints and pulls things together. So the idea there is something pulls all of these things together. Something is, 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 uh, enacts all of these things and energizes them all, and that's the idea of love. Love is what pulls it all together. And then the final phrase is, uses the word, it's not the bond of perfection, uh, I might translate it, which is the, the ligament or the, the connector, the connecting device. And then the last word, which is translated perfection, is a form of the Greek noun teleos, which doesn't mean perfection, the sense of flawlessness in its use in the New Testament. It always relates to maturity. And so if you retranslate this, this verse 14, but above all these, that is these five things I just mentioned, going beyond that, put on love which pulls together everything toward maturity. So if we want to grow to maturity, it is love that in pulling all of these things together that pulls us into maturity so that it's not that you can't love as, a, as an immature believer. Any of you who are parents or grandparents, you look at three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, they have a three-year-old love, a four-year-old love, a five-year-old love. But it's not a mature love. It's an immature love. But when you, you look at an adult child who is 20, 25, 30, 35, and they look at you and they say, I love you, that means so much more than what comes from a three-year-old. Three-year-old makes you feel good, and you're glad, but you're a mother, and they're a three-year-old. But when it's a 30-year-old, especially coming out of some 30-year-old's periods of adolescence, and they say that, it has real significance because there's, there's maturity with it. And that's what Paul's getting at here is what pulls all of this together as we grow to maturity is love. And you're not going to get there as a believer. You and I cannot get to maturity as a believer. First of all, if we're not putting on this new set of clothes related to an other-centered mentality, not a self-centered mentality. As long as we have a self-centered mentality, mentality where we're concerned about our problems and our pain and our difficulties and our agenda and the details in our lives, we're not going to get anywhere. We have to replace that, put on a new set of clothes that's completely concerned and focused on God's agenda. And frankly, every decision that we make in life as believers needs to be made in light of that decision of what is best in terms of God's purpose in my life. Let me give you a, a couple of examples. <clears throat> Let's say you are 
30 or 40 years old, and you're getting, you, get, you have a job opportunity. You have an opportunity to go work for a company. It would be a great advancement. You would make a tremendous amount of money. And it's easy, trust me, it's very easy for us to rationalize that if I go work for that company and take advantage of that, then I will be financially set and my family will be financially secure. And after all, doesn't God want me to provide for my family and to give them financial security? The only fly in the ointment is that by taking that job, you're not anywhere near a local church or where you can fellowship with other believers or serve the Lord. Now, God didn't call you to work for XYZ Company to take care and provide for the security of your family. Hello? That's an objective that we all have, but ultimately the security and provision for my family is in the God's hands. It's not in my hands. And if I substitute the provision of my family for financial security, for a place where I can study the, the Word and serve the Lord, then I've committed idolatry. And, and I'm not making that decision for the right reasons. The, our ultimate goal is to serve the Lord and to grow to spiritual maturity. And that has got to qualify. And so, and many of you know people like this, and some of you are like this. If you're living in uh, some place in this country, and you know that if I go live and in this other area where there's a good Bible teaching and a good church where I can grow to spiritual maturity, but I'm not going to have the financial security and the job options there that I have if I take this other offer. What choice? What's your choice? Too often today, people are making the choice, I'm going to go for the money. See, they're just spiritual losers. See, some of you moved clean across the country or jumped continents in order to be someplace where you were taught the word. God's going to take care of you. and turn, you, you don't know what kind of job opportunities or financial uh, blessing you're going to get by making the right decision, but you, you will have that one way or the other because God's the one who's in charge. The ultimate issue has to be that we're going to make God's agenda our agenda, and that's what drives us. And that affects things like college. That affects things like uh, choices of a, of a spouse. But wherever it is that we're going, the choices we make, it's not an either or. But it is a choice that what governs my other choices is ultimately, is this going to be the place where I can get the best Bible teaching, the best spiritual nourishment, and serve the Lord best? That's the controlling priority. It's not the only consideration, but it is the controlling uh, priority for growing, maturing uh, believers. And it involves this attitude of, I'm not here, realizing I'm not here in this life for me. It's not about me. It's not about my promotion. It's not about my agenda. It's not about my career. It's not about my achievements. It's all about growing to spiritual maturity and serving the Lord. And if you have, go to the greatest schools and have tremendous academic achievement, and if all of these things are yours, but you failed in serving the Lord and pursuing spiritual maturity because you just weren't where that would happen, then those other accomplishments will mean nothing when you get into eternity. The focus has to be upon God. Now, where we're going from this in 15, 16, and 17 is, is, is gives us means by which we're able to accomplish those things, and we'll begin there uh, next time with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word, to be challenged by these things, to recognize that it really isn't about us. This is probably the most difficult things, thing for us to really grasp is it's not about us. It's about you. And when we're trusting you, as we read in, in the Psalms this morning and saying, you are our fortress. You are the one who provides for us. Ultimately, it is not us. We have responsibilities that we are to, uh, that we are to seriously consider. But ultimately, when we fulfill our responsibilities at the exclusion of our ultimate responsibility to grow to spiritual maturity and serve you, then we failed. We have to learn to put on this other-centered, God-centered mentality
that is oriented to grace, compassion and kindness and uh, long-suffering with others that is manifested and strengthened by the way we bear with one another and forgive one another because of what Christ has done for us. Father, we pray that you would challenge us with what we studied and we may be able to see with objectivity the areas where we need to apply and grow in our own lives in these areas and that uh, we would be responsive to it. Father, we also pray that if there's anyone here that is unsure of their salvation or uncertain of their eternal destiny, that they would uh, make sure of what that is right now. Scripture says the solution is simple because Jesus Christ did all the complex work. He paid the penalty for our sin on the cross so that all that is left is for us to accept it, to believe in him, to receive the free gift of eternal life, of forgiveness of sins, that we have that simply by trusting in Christ. And that when the moment we trust in him, all these things happen. We become a new creature in Christ. We put off the old man. We put on the new. And we have a new identity, a new dress code. Everything is ours. And you supply us with everything we need at that instant of salvation. Father, we pray that you would uh, drive these points home to us as we reflect upon them and think about them in the coming days. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.